Everybody has their own guilty shame when it comes to their media-consuming past. A book, a television show, a movie, or a band that they might have liked once upon a time ago, but can't stand the thought of ever liking it at all today. This all stems from the fact that humans aren't static beings. We change with time and experience, and our taste should only change with us. It's one of the most intriguing aspects of the shared human condition that once upon a time, you were proud to say that you owned Floored by Sugar Ray. And looking back on it now, you die a little inside. All right, it may not be Sugar Ray specifically that makes you cringe, but you get the idea. For anime fans of a certain age though, you can count on most of them ruining the day they ever said they were fans of Gundam Wing. Let it be said that it wasn't the original Mobile Suit Gundam that kickstarted American interest in the franchise, nor was it the tragically underrated 0083 Stardust memory. Let the record show that it was Gundam Wing that catapulted Gundam into the US spotlight, helped along by the fact that it was the first Gundam series to be broadcast here in the States on our beloved Toonami. It was a smash success. So much so, in fact, that Bondi was never able to capture that same level of popularity over here ever again. And that's because Wing was a horse of a different color at the time. If you got into the Gundam franchise with Wing as your launching point, you were in for a sore disappointment. In Japan, Wing was sort of a reboot of the entire television franchise, as four of the previous five series were set in the original Mobile Suit Gundam continuity, the Universal Century timeline. The other series, by the way, was Mobile Fighter G Gundam, which will have its own review one day. Patience. From that perspective, you can understand the thought process that went into Wing. A brand new timeline, brand new characters, a brand new aesthetic, and a brand new way to approach themes of war. No longer are we following a cast of dozens as befitting a wartime story, rather we centralize on five protagonists and their personal relationships with each other in war. It was simply unlike anything in Gundam. At the time, it was a fresh coat of paint on a then 16-year-old property. But as the years went on, cracks began to show. In fact, I put it to you that Gundam Wing is the most terribly aged anime to have ever reached the States, based purely on what it began. Sure, with the recent release of a Blu-ray special edition, it can be said that the series is still held in high regards, but I'm not talking about that so much as I'm talking about legacy. You see, Gundam Wing started an ongoing and dramatic turn for nearly every series that has come out since, much to many a Gundam fan's chagrin. That turn? Pretty boys with problems! Yeah! When you really break down the mechanics of Gundam Wing, they're basically a boy band in space. You got the cute one, the funny one, the shy one, the one no one really gives a shit about, and the bad boy. Considering this was first broadcast in March of 2000, no wonder this was immensely popular. It's not much of a stretch to ask an impressionable tween girl to see a show about five cute boys and their issues. Mmm! You see where the cringe starts happening? And it's also no wonder that Bondi couldn't replicate Wing's success here in the States. It was the perfect anime at the perfect time to capitalize on that all-important 10 to 14 year old female demographic. But try they did, pumping out more pretty boys with problems to smaller and smaller returns. In a way, Gundam Wing was where it all went wrong for Gundam for a long time afterward. I'm not saying you should feel bad for liking Gundam Wing if you did. All I'm saying is that I've never met a Wing fan who grew up in the 90s who talks about it without being on his or her back foot. Me personally though, I never liked Wing to begin with. Shocking, I know. I mean, besides my well-documented irritation to pretty boys with problems, the series always felt like it dragged way too much for me. And though the technical and character design still looks beautiful today, it's all in the service of this melodramatic, overwrought story featuring five leads I could not care less for. The only one of the five I could stand was Duo, and that's because he wasn't a dour wet blanket. He was even capable of being funny every once in a while, but even he succumbed to pretty boys with problem syndrome. And while Hiro, Chang, and Troa graded on me, it was Quatra Catchre this fucker that really kicked me in the balls. What the hell is up with this little shit anyway? He's this mealy-mouthed little wisp of a Gundam pilot who just can't go one scene without this dopey-eyed G-shucks disposition and apologizing for every little slight, imagined or real. He's like Butters from South Park, except his characterization isn't being played for a cruel joke later in the episode. I hate his stupid face. I hate his stupid woe is me. I pilot a Gundam even though I'm a pacifist diatribes. I hate his stupid clothes. And most of all, I hate his stupid name. I mean, look at that. It's like his parents named him by pulling tiles out of a Crown Royal bag. 
So, imagine the state I'm in with today's episode being on Gundam Wing, Endless Waltz. A 1997 sequel OVA to the original series that was lengthened and re-edited into a film in 1998, Endless Waltz is, at best, a harmless addition to the Gundam canon, and that's about as good as it's gonna get from me. But hey, at least it's set around Christmas time, so it's got that going for it. This is Endless Waltz. We begin with a year-long peace between the colonies and Earth, and so our brave heroes decide to retire their Gundams by blasting them off into the sun. That's right, our movie starts by ripping off Superman 4. Why would you steal from the second, third, worst Superman movie and not include Nuclear Man? Yeah, you're just an experiment, Freako. <laughs> Oh, no. I'm gonna miss you, Sandrock. See you later, old buddy. Wait, I thought you two hated being Gundam pilots because of all the death involved. Why are you getting all misty-eyed nostalgic now? Hey, you don't suppose that them laying down their arms would bite them in the ass, would it? Especially since only four of the five of them are doing it, and the fifth one is an avowed warrior whose entire existence seems predicated upon a very simple mindset of eliminating all that he deems evil. Eh, maybe I'm just being pessimistic. Or maybe I've been around the block before, because while everyone on Earth is celebrating Christmas and the one-year anniversary of the war ending, Relina has slipped a hot Cosby during a political visit to a newly formed colony. Be very gentle with her. No comment. Yes, it seems Dacum Barton is still kicking around and making a racket by targeting Troa Barton by throwing easily dispatched goons at him. Those always work! I guess he hasn't given up yet. Or maybe it's Leia's daughter. I think her name was Mari Mea. Oh yes, they're going there. Yep, seems Trey's had a daughter no one mentioned before this movie, and the only reason Troa knew about her was because the real Troa Barton, long story, brought out a photo of her and showed it to him, for no discernible reason other than for the plot. But hey, just because she's the granddaughter of a military despot... As of today, you are starting on the road to glory! The awakening of a new humanity will be triggered by the soldiers of Marimer, and we shall be the symbol of hope for the people. Doesn't mean she's gonna turn out to be Damien Thorne. I'm told that there's an adult world that children do not understand. So I can't begin to explain why I have come to live in this world. But accepting the facts as they are, I fully intend to carry out my father's wishes. Aw, oh, aren't you just the cutest little brutal dictator in the whole wide world? I'm building a box. <laughs> you won't see it until you're inside of it. So yes, Trey's had a secret daughter that was somewhere, presumably, with Dacum here, and now that the Earth has sworn off war, the Foundation is going to swoop in and try to take over the world. I swear I've heard this setup before, but where was it? Oh yes! Every single horrible fanfic ever written! What was so wrong with letting Dacum be the lone antagonist here? He practically is, since he's treating Marimea like a puppet to goad his remaining loyalists into cooperation. I get that they're trying to have a point about how violence can be pathological and inherited, passed on from generation to generation, but by doing that, they have to break open the seams of the narrative by haphazardly introducing Marimea into the story by the clunkiest of means. And if you're about to say that it was better explained in the Ground Zero manga, if the movie was able to fit her in without blindsiding the audience, that they wouldn't have had to make Ground Zero in the first place. <sighs> like I said, never liked Wing. In any case, news of Relina's abduction reaches the ears of Hero and Duo, and they make off for the colony without their Gundams. Of course, hearing this, Catra makes it all about his guilt over FedExing their Gundams into the freaking sun. We're faced with great danger, and I've taken away the only means to counter this situation from everyone. Oh, you Poor, sweet, misguided little idiot. You expect me to feel bad for you? At the heart of my problems with characters like these is that they're selfish about making every situation about them and their guilt in some way, no matter how tangential it may seem. I wouldn't be surprised if one day he starts saying that his lack of effort 
is the reason there's no air in outer space. Think about it. What was Catcher's reaction to hearing that one of his closest allies, Relina, was abducted and in mortal danger? Concerned for her safety? No, it's I foolishly sent our Gundams rocketing into the sun and now my brothers in arms are going to go rescue her on foot. And the most irritating thing about this is that the movie, and by extension the anime, is framing this as some kind of noble mindset, when it's really just an excuse to run over the same old ground of, you guessed it, pretty boys with problems. Does Catra correct his mistake? Yes. But does he learn from his mistake? Hell to the no. And that's what's so infuriating about him. He's like a little kid who cries about making a mess on the carpet, and then keeps making a mess on the carpet. So the whole farewell to Gundams plays out to be a transparent means to shudder them for a good chunk of the movie, leaving room for us to enjoy these nonsensical flashbacks that are supposed to flesh out what happened between the pilots and the scientists that built their respective Gundams. Hmm, I see you are planning to kill me after you destroy Death Scythe. I was gonna kill everyone here, including myself. If it meant peace for this colony, I'd be the god of death any day. So in order to stop a massacre from happening, you were going to massacre everyone who worked on your Gundam, including yourself. Methinks you're missing the point here, duo. Of course, Hero's flashback is less antithetical to his character and motivation. In fact, it does a great job at reinforcing his motivation. Annoyance! Hi there. Are you lost? <laughs> I said, are you lost? I've been lost ever since the day I was born. Oh dear Christ, just listen to your Elliot Smith albums and shut the fuck up! Hmm, out of nowhere little girl in a sundress and hat walking a puppy? Yep, she's rat bait. Grave of the Fireflies wasn't this forced. Ugh. And with that, Marimea broadcasts that her colony is declaring independence from the Earth Unified Government and declaring war. It's a good thing that the Earth basically abandoned all their defenses for the sake of peace, because the Loyalists are some of the worst shots this side of a stormtrooper. Look at them! They can't even hit Duo and Hero, who are in a shuttle as they rocket past them into their colony. The only reason why these assholes are considered a threat is because they're picking on somebody that doesn't have a means to defend themselves. It's like sucker punching Stephen Hawking. Hero and Duo make their way inside the colony and split up before Duo is pinned down by a familiar foe. Hey, I know this. I know this style of combat. Ah yes, that ever distinctive style of standing in one place and bullet hosing a hallway. Who could ever pull off such an eloquent style? Why, it's Troa Barton, who seems to have been forcibly conscripted into their ranks after a botched infiltration attempt sussed out by Wu Fei. Gasp? Troa is about to finish off Duo, but in comes another flashback to save the day. Seems that Troa here suddenly wants to remember the day he took the identity of Dacum Barton's son after he was killed to prevent him from talking to his dad about how the developers of the Heavy Arms Gundam are getting cold feet about it getting used to conquer Earth. Told you it was a long story. Are you saying you'll pilot this Gundam suit Heavy Arms? Yes, I've become fond of this suit, but I have absolutely no interest in conquering Earth. Why not? As of this moment, your name is Troa Barton. Now if you will excuse me, I am going to confuse the shit out of people with my movies! Also, how in the hell does this talented Mr. Ripley bullshit even make the barest notion of sense? You mean to tell me that the son of one of the most powerful men in the solar system wouldn't be recognized as... Not him? They're not even close! But before I can even begin to try and make sense out of all this, the movie doubles down upon itself and pulls this mathematical nonsense out of its ass. Catra and his men are trying to retrieve the Gundams before they reach the sun, and they keep saying that they have several days before they can even reach it, which means over the course of this rescue, even with all the shortcuts they managed to use, the whole process should have taken at least a few days, even though the story itself takes place over the course of, what, two days, maybe? What do they do, time travel? If we detonated the power furnace and used the explosion as our propelling force, the ship can return to Earth in no time. We'd fly the ship to Venus and use the catapult effect of its gravity to hurl us toward Earth. Uh, no you won't. You will actually waste more fuel trying to escape Venus's gravity well way before you gain any momentum by being in its pull. Oh, wait. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Minovsky particles. Master Catra, I want you to know that every one of us is ready to give our lives up for you at any time. There is nothing more precious than life in this universe. 
You know, for somebody who keeps professing the sanctity of life, you sure are quick to volunteer yourself for suicide missions. Self-righteous jackass. And sure enough, 40 hours goes by as they catch up to the Gundams, and Catra manages to get himself on the satellite without dying. I've safely arrived on the satellite. <sighs> Take care, everyone. Say hi to the goddess of Venus. Venus is the goddess, you moron! Meanwhile, Dacum is about to enter Earth's orbit when all of a sudden the tall geese enters the fray. This is Preventer Wind calling. Sex Marquis! I thought you were dead. That's right, I was. But I find that I cannot quietly sleep in my grave. Like I said, bad fanfic. For those of you lost right now, this here is Zex Marquis, the final boss of Gundam Wing, as it were. He's basically Wing's answer to Char, except here he wears the mask after he abandoned his proper name, Miliardo Peacecraft. Allegedly, he gave up the name after his kingdom was destroyed, but personally speaking, I think he gave up the name because it's Miliardo Peacecraft. <laughs> Be surprised how long I can keep this up. Zex is stopped cold when Dacum alerts him to the fact that they could easily drop their colony onto Earth, but then Duo and Hero meet back up with Troa, who's just been pretending to be on the Loyalist side, and they save the colony all within five minutes. So yeah, why are these guys threats again? Don't worry, I've already taken care of them. But they prevented the colony's instability. <coughs> Hold it! Hey, wait, stop that! Uh, what? I swear to God, the only thing that was missing in that scene was the Roadrunner going beep beep. These guys are just clowns. And off Hero goes to reclaim his Wing Gundam from Catra, even though from where he is, the Gundam should take over 40 hours to reach him, and it's still somehow Christmas on Earth. Still, Santa Hero better double time to Earth because the Loyalists have taken over and little Marimeya here is practicing her villain monologue. History is much like an endless waltz. The three beats of war, peace, and revolution continue on forever. And I should know, I'm this many years old! The instant this year comes to an end, I will be on the top of the Earth's sphere and the dawn of a new age will arrive. I will rule the world. So your plan to stop humanity's endless waltz of war, peace, and revolution is to declare war and force peace through a revolution. Yeah, that sounds like a plan written on construction paper with crayons. Of course, the Loyalists have a surprise waiting for Hero in the form of Wufei. So why is he with them again? Is this what you interpret as justice? I need to determine for myself whether or not peace at the expense of lives can really be defined as peace. <laughs> And I will become evil itself to find out! Oh, he turned evil, so that way the movie has a reason for these two characters to fight each other. Now, who's going to be the first one to tap and says Martha? I kid, but if I'm being honest, Batman v Superman has a much more believable reason for the characters to fight each other than Endless Waltz. Because at the very least, there was an ideological difference between the two that was clear cut and easily identifiable. It was written horribly, but at least it was there. Endless Waltz, there's just nothing here. Wufei talks about how the Earth didn't change after the war, but the movie established that there was a global lasting peace before this whole shit show began, so... What in the hell is Wufei talking about? What did they expect to happen after they achieved world peace? Better world peace? I'm acting for the people who are used as weapons. I'm fighting on behalf of all soldiers, including yourself! <sighs> Wufei. Right now, you and I are fighting like this. Isn't it true that you feel fulfilled as I do whenever you're engaged in a fight? Oh, so you're fighting for a world that will never have peace because then soldiers like you will have purpose in their lives, so you join the Loyalists to take over the world, whose entire reason for being was to ensure a lasting peace under their reign, a peace the world already had, and... Ah, oh, fuck it, and you wonder why nobody gives a shit about Wu Fei. Especially now that we have The Punisher on Netflix. First time as long as I can remember, I don't have a war to fight. I guess, if I'm gonna be honest, I just... I'm scared. 
But the boys are back in town after Duo and Troa escape the colony like it ain't no thing. Jesus, these guys are the worst. They meet back up with Katra and the battle for Earth begins. Grandpa, I thought there weren't going to be any more wars. I know. Then why are those people still having a war? Because Bondi needs that coke and whore money, dear. Oh, I'm sorry. Milk and cookies money. The three meet up with Zex and Noen and proceed to clean house, but for some harebrained reason decide to try and make a point by not killing the human soldiers inside the suits. You two are truly impressive. You fought this many without killing one soldier. I'd be glad even if we could teach these people something. Let's only take the weapons and war itself along with us to hell. Where the hell was this attitude of yours here, duo? <laughs> the rotation of a colony is increased. The Gundams are sent to gain mastery. Oh, and what about here? I mean, they could be just automated suits, but if there's no way for us to know, how the hell would duo know? And what about here when Zex blew up all these ships? Or were they all just autopiloted too? In conclusion, you're all dicks. For the last half hour, the movie basically drags ass with a bunch of mobile suits getting blowed up good while the pilots slowly run out of ammo. That is, until Wu Fei snaps out of it and rejoins them and Hiro wakes up from his fight with Wu Fei to finally come knocking on Marimea's blast shielded door. At his wit's end, Dacum attempts to kill Relena, but winds up plugging Marimea instead. Hmm. Well, bullet for bullet, it seems, as he himself is taken out by one of his own soldiers. And the stupidest part of the movie happens as Hiro finally makes his way to confront Marimea, a girl he has never even interacted with before right now. I thank you. Okay, that in of itself is pretty stupid already, but really think about what's going on here. He enters the scene having no idea that she got shot by her own grandfather and just sees her cradled in the arms of Relena and immediately goes for his gun. Now, the question I find myself asking here is that did he always mean to show this empty gesture to her or was he really counting on there being a bullet inside that chamber? Doesn't matter though as Marimea slowly slips away. We can still save her. Take her to the doctor. Yes, ma'am. Oh, fuck you. She's dead. Look at all that blood she lost. Even Schwarzenegger wouldn't be able to get up from that, much less a seven-year-old girl. And on that insulting note, the movie finally ends. Thank the baby Jesus. I mean, the biggest sin this movie commits is the inability to coherently present its themes on war and peace. While the message of peace being a global effort is an admirable one, it's told in an absolutely slapdash manner. Character motivations are all over the place, half of the cast has no reason to be in the movie proper, and the fact that the story ends where it began, with them finally sending the Gundams into the sun, really shows that no one learned a goddamn thing. It doesn't help that the characters themselves annoy the piss out of me, but to see them bumble around in this at best below tier two parter episode is just aggravating. Lastly, and this is a minor point, but for a movie set around Christmas time, you'd think their message of peace on earth and goodwill toward men would be strengthened by the setting, but by God, do you forget about it throughout the movie? Die Hard had more of a Christmas feel. And that's why I will not let December end on this nutcracker of a movie. You want Gundam? You want Christmas? You want good? Well, guess what? You get to have it all with the last episode of the year, War in the Pocket. Till next time. <laughs>